Hi. Hello. Good evening, everybody. I'm Councilwoman Jeanette Martinez, and I'm proud to serve you here in District 11. As you all know, we are experiencing a housing crisis here in Fort Worth, and that's why we put together this event to inform you on what the city's doing about it and to hear about some of the barriers that there are. Uh, today, we will hear from community leaders and partners whose work directly influences our affordable housing projects. Um, so that's pretty much all I have to say. Uh, I want to introduce you to our assistant city manager, Fernando Costa. He will be the moderator for today's panel discussion. Fernando, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Councilmember Martinez. Uh, we appreciate uh, your leadership on the Fort Worth City Council uh, and everything you do to advance uh, community development uh, in Fort Worth. And uh, this evening, uh, we are uh, celebrating the community development block grant and home uh, programs. Uh, these are uh, programs uh, uh, sponsored by the U.S. Department of Housing and uh, uh, Urban Development. And uh, I've been asked to say a few words uh, uh, at the beginning about uh, my involvement uh, with the, these programs. And I got to thinking uh, about uh, uh, my background uh, uh, with them. I actually uh, remember when the uh, U.S. Congress uh, uh, passed and uh, President Ford signed into law the Housing and Community Development Act of 1974. I was a graduate student at the time. And so it occurs to me uh, as we're getting ready to celebrate the 50th anniversary of CDBG, I've been uh, involved with it. Uh, throughout that time. Uh, and currently, I had the uh, privilege of uh, overseeing the Neighborhood Services Department in the city of Fort Worth, which is responsible for administering the CDBG and home uh, programs uh, in our city. And uh, the department uh, uh, does an excellent job uh, uh, in that regard. Uh, I'm um, uh, thrilled to introduce uh, uh, four experts uh, in uh, affordable housing and community development. And uh, it's uh, common to use the, the term experts uh, casually, uh, but these are really four experts uh, in uh, uh, the field. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, so much so that as I look at them, I'm reminded of Mount Rushmore, uh, which uh, represents the uh, the faces of four uh, distinguished uh, U.S. presidents. These are four distinguished uh, leaders uh, of Fort Worth, and I'm happy to introduce uh, them to you. And then I would ask uh, each of them in turn uh, to share with us just a few words uh, about uh, uh, their work uh, on a daily basis and how uh, they participate in the Community Development Block Grant and Home uh, Programs. Uh, first, uh, uh, beginning on the left of the screen uh, uh, and the, the right of the table uh, as I face them, uh, we have uh, uh, Ms. Ebony Rose, uh, who chairs the Community Development Council uh, of the city. This is the appointed uh, board uh, a board appointed by the Fort Worth City Council that uh, oversees the allocation of federal funds uh, for uh, community development uh, and affordable housing purposes. And so uh, the Community Development Council receives information uh, and recommendations from the Neighborhood Services Department staff, uh, discusses uh, that information, hears from uh, interested uh, residents, and eventually makes recommendations to the Fort Worth City Council. Uh, and uh, uh, most commonly, the City Council has such high respect for the recommendations from the Community Development Council that the uh, City Council will adopt those recommendations. Uh, and so uh, uh, we're happy to have uh, uh, Ms. Rose with us uh, in her uh, 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 day job, but uh, serves as a consultant, uh, an educator, 
uh, with uh, uh, expertise in, uh, in community development and uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, has uh, been recipient of awards for her work uh, uh, with TCU and other uh, organizations, and uh, we're very happy to have uh, Ms. Rose with us. Uh, then we have uh, Ms. Uh, Mary Margaret Lemons, uh, uh, president of Fort Worth Housing Solutions, uh, which is also known as a, uh, historically known as a uh, Fort Worth Housing Authority, the Housing Authority of the City of Fort Worth. Uh, it is a, uh, a public agency uh, with a board uh, that's appointed by the mayor of Fort Worth, uh, but operates uh, uh, in a uh, semi-autonomous uh, fashion with a great deal of uh, entrepreneurship. Uh, historically, uh, we have tended to think of housing authorities as uh, local agencies that merely administer public housing funds. Uh, that uh, model of public housing is uh, a thing of the past. Uh, and the Fort Worth Housing Authority, Fort Worth Housing Solutions, has been a leader uh, in that change uh, uh, for many years, and, and much of it has been uh, precipitated by uh, Mary Margaret Lemons, uh, who has turned that organization into a, a very agile uh, agency uh, that uh, assesses the needs of the community and responds to them uh, uh, in a direct way. And uh, I have to say, uh, that agency is also an exceptional partner uh, for the city. Whenever the city needs something uh, from uh, Fort Worth Housing Solutions, Mary Margaret is uh, on the spot uh, to respond. So we're very happy that Mary Margaret's with us. Uh, uh, Gage Yeager uh, is uh, next to, to Mary Margaret. He's uh, the, the CEO, Chief Executive Officer for Trinity Habitat for Humanity. Uh, Gage has been around uh, uh, longer than uh, anyone can remember. Uh, including, me. including Gage himself. He's beginning to lose uh, much of his uh, uh, vast memory. Uh, but uh, Gage has a fabulous uh, uh, spirit about him. Uh, uh, he does what he does because he believes in what he does, uh, and it's evident uh, in all of his actions. Uh, people love Gage uh, uh, because uh, uh, they respect his commitment to not just to uh, the development of affordable housing, uh, but truly the empowerment of the families who reside within the, the homes that he and uh, um, a legion of volunteers uh, helped to, uh, to create. Uh, so Gage, thank you for being with us. Uh, uh, Gage is uh, well known, not just in Fort Worth, but uh, around the country and uh, truly around the world. He does uh, mission work. Uh, in other countries. In fact, uh, a few years ago, I was, you may remember, Gage, I, I happened to be in uh, El Salvador. Uh, and I thought, I'm glad to be somewhere where no one will know where I am. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and so I, I meet this uh, young lady who was involved in uh, working with the poor in El Salvador. And uh, she asked me where I'm from. I said, well, I'm from Texas. So where from? from Texas. I said, well, I'm from Fort Worth. Well, you must know Gage Yeager. <laughs> and, uh, and so uh, I, can't, uh, I can't escape him. So uh, we're delighted that you're here, Gage. And, and then uh, certainly not least on the panel uh, is uh, Daniel Smith, uh, who is uh, a managing director of Ahala Partners uh, and, and uh, a magnificent uh, 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 leader in the real estate development industry. Uh, he's been a great friend of Fort Worth, uh, always uh, uh, ready to tackle the hardest real estate development projects uh, in our city. And I don't say that lightly. Uh, I could give many examples of the work that he's done uh, in all parts of Fort Worth. Uh, but um, I'll mention just a couple uh, that I think are, are notable. Uh, Daniel exceeded everybody's expectations with the uh, redevelopment of a, uh, of a hotel uh, 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 near North uh, Beach Street, uh, northeast uh, uh, Fort Worth, uh, that had been uh, uh, affected by, by crime and, 
all kinds of uh, illicit activities. We had an opportunity uh, after uh, COVID uh, uh, struck to use some federal funds to create what we call permanent supportive housing to house folks who otherwise uh, would be homeless, and actually were homeless and had been homeless for a year or more with uh, one or more uh, disabilities. So it's a great need, but uh, the federal government said you have to expend these funds uh, by the end of the year 2020. You have, to, you have to spend the money or else you have to return it to us. And uh, most folks said, well, there's no way we can possibly develop over 100 units of permanent supportive housing uh, in, uh, in four or five months. It's just not possible. Well, the folks who were uh, expressing that skepticism did not know uh, Daniel Smith uh, in Ohala because he got it done uh, in league with uh, uh, Mary Margaret Lemons and, and Fort Worth Housing Solutions. Uh, it was amazing. Uh, uh, and it was uh, a, such an accomplishment that uh, uh, cities all over the United States came to Fort Worth to, to learn how we had managed to develop so much permanent supportive housing of high quality uh, in such a short period of time. And so uh, when uh, uh, the time came to, to explore opportunities for housing on the south side of Fort Worth uh, in the Hemp Hill Corridor, uh, the first uh, person to whom we turned was Daniel Smith, and he said he had an idea to redevelop a, uh, a, a piece of uh, obsolete industrial property uh, in Worth Heights. Uh, and, uh, and again, folks were skeptical and said, can't be done, can't be done. There's, uh, people will object to it uh, for a host of reasons. Uh, there are too many interested uh, groups, the, the property is too complex, it's got flooding problems, uh, it's got uh, 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 pollution from uh, uh, long time uh, industrial use, uh, all kinds of problems, that, but uh, Mr. Smith was undaunted, uh, moved ahead in partnership with the city and many others, uh, and uh, the project is now under construction to be completed by the end of this calendar year. And uh, uh, Daniel, we're going to uh, find a way to uh, address the railroad noise and uh, issue a certificate of occupancy uh, for you uh, before the end of uh, 2024, uh, which is our deadline um, under the, the funding that, that we've received for the project. So uh, someone who does not know uh, uh, what it means uh, uh, to say it can't be done. He, uh, Daniel Smith does not understand uh, that, uh, that expression. So we've got uh, four truly outstanding leaders uh, with us tonight. Uh, you couldn't find better folks to talk with us about uh, affordable housing and community development. Uh, we heard already from uh, Councilor Martinez, we do have a housing crisis in Fort Worth. Uh, it's an issue across the country, but it's uh, uh, acute here in Fort Worth, uh, uh, where the average family can no longer afford the average home in Fort Worth. Uh, used to be just um, uh, uh, 15 or 20 years ago, we could say that Fort Worth was the most affordable uh, big city in Texas. Uh, but housing prices and uh, apartment rents have, have, have risen uh, dramatically. Uh, so that if you're uh, uh, a young uh, individual or a couple uh, trying to buy your first home, uh, for, for most folks, it's, uh, it's a stretch uh, if, it's, uh, if it's even possible. Uh, and so we're working to, to make uh, housing more affordable in Fort Worth on a variety of fronts. And the Community Development Block Grant Program and the Home Program are, are valuable resources uh, toward that end. So uh, let's begin. And I'd like to ask uh, 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 first uh, Ms. Rose, Ebony Rose, to uh, describe for us uh, uh, your role uh, as it pertains to, to these uh, uh, grant programs, uh, how you're involved uh, uh, in implementing them, and, and what impact uh, do you uh, think that uh, uh, your work has had 
on affordable housing and community development in Fort Worth. Great, thank you. Happy to get us started. Hi, everyone. Um, I serve currently, this keeps going in and out, but maybe it's okay. Uh, I serve currently as the chair of the Community Development Council. I'm on my third term on that council and in my second term as chair of that of that body. And um, I'm the mayor's appointee. I served per first under Mayor Price and um, have also now been appointed by Mayor Parker. So really a lovely space for me to get to be in. I came to this body as a relatively new resident to the city of Fort Worth. Once I realized I was gonna be here for a little while, as most folks who move to a new city, you're not quite sure. And then you realize you wanna put down some roots. And so I came into the city and immediately found connection here because of the work that I think is important around community building and creating spaces where we all get to thrive, however that needs to look for us. And this body has been really important in helping me understand the needs of our, our citizens in the city and also helping me to know where to point people when they're in need, which I think is such a, a critical element. One of the hard things about being on the CDC is recognizing that there are so many city services that are our citizens don't know exist. And we spend a lot of time in that um, body trying to figure out how to make sure we're getting the word out and working with our neighborhood services staff who do a fantastic job day in, day out in supporting the citizens of our city. But on that body, it is important for us to make sure that when we talk about federal funding, folks understand what that means, what it means to receive uh, grant funding, how to utilize that well, what happens when your deadlines uh, are up and how, how important it is to stay on, on time in building projects and other community initiatives. And I think that's a big part of our work. And as we go through the year, we help by receiving all of the different interested parties who want to apply for those grants. So those nonprofit agencies, community partners, submit their applications through neighborhood services. Our body reviews that in partnership with neighborhood services and then make those recommendations to the city. So it is a heavy lift to think about how the city is going to wisely use millions of dollars. And I think the members on our um, board understand the importance of what we do. And it's fun to get to work with our members in that way to think about that. We represent the entire city. So we've got members from each district who are um, appointed there by one of their council persons. And year over year, we get to see those changes occur. And that's always really great to see what we saw in paper. Uh, and in a few years, there's buildings and families thriving, community centers that have been renovated, community spaces that have been updated, community programs that are happening. To see those things go from an application to reality and how it impacts our community is one of the greatest joys of getting to be on that body. Thank you, Ms. Rose. Uh, we appreciate your leadership uh, in making that happen. Uh, Mary Margaret. Well, usually I get to be the recipient of these funds. And so I um, am really excited when we have a project that qualifies and that matches up timing wise for these funds to be available. Um, for years, we were pretty self-sufficient and didn't require some of the money that the city has. And we were able to develop pretty independently. And then things have gotten harder. Construction costs have gone up, land costs have gone up. And so we have gaps on projects now. And especially on some of our more difficult to develop projects, going into the urban core and trying to redevelop in neighborhoods that need a lot of infrastructure work and um, aren't the pretty flat land out in the suburbs to develop on. And so this money really comes in handy to close those gaps. And when we're structuring these deals, they can have up to 13 different funding sources and that last two million dollars is a make it or break it um, point for us and so we get to put them in projects like stop six that are happening right now um, both cdbg and home have been used in multiple phases of that project and so that's where i think the partnership really comes in because not only is the city a, a co-lead applicant on that grant application to hud but we have aligned our strategic plans um, the city just put out their affordable housing plan our strategic plan takes that into account and we make sure that we're moving together um, as we're working and that everything aligns because we always wanna be supportive of the city's initiatives and we want the city um, to, to sign off on what we do. We think it's important that we collaborate um, so we don't compete or get in each other's way but are able to do more together because honestly there's not enough funding to go around. Um, I think at this point we need about 30,000 affordable housing units in the city of Fort Worth and there's no way we can build our way out of that. And so, um, 
we have to work at it from a couple of different angles and making sure that we're talking about um, housing wages is important right now. Anytime I'm in front of people, I always say, um, in 2024, you need to make $21.17 an hour to afford an efficiency apartment in Tarrant County. And so right now, if you're making a decision on somebody's wages and you don't know that, or you're not paying that much, you're adding to my affordable housing problem. And I say my, because I take it very personally. I grew up here, and I think Fort Worth is a great place, but we're quickly turning into a place that's making it very hard to raise a family and to, to exist. So um, CDBG and, C and, and home funding is very important to what I do every day. The housing authority, like Fernando said, we don't just administer um, public housing or housing choice vouchers. Um, we actually own and operate over 55 properties throughout the city. And so we have properties in every city council district all the way up, um, I call it Oklahoma, but they tell me it's Fort Worth, way up there close to Haslett, um, down south close to Everman, um, all the way past Loop 820 on the west side and almost to the airport. We're right there at the new American Airlines headquarters over on Trinity and 360. So um, we try to have affordable housing in every pocket of Fort Worth where people would wanna live so people get a choice, right? We don't believe in warehousing people um, in need in large locations um, like was done back in the 30s and 40s. And so we don't have any traditional public housing left in, in Fort Worth today. Everything is mixed income um, and, and spread out. And if you drove by it, um, you wouldn't know that it's affordable. It looks like class A property and that's our goal. We want anybody to feel comfortable living there. Well, Mary Margaret, let me, let me underscore one of your points about uh, paying uh, a suitable wage uh, by which uh, folks can afford uh, to live in Fort Worth. If I'm not mistaken, you have uh, actually uh, made a decision to pay all of your employees uh, at least the amount that they need to afford housing in Fort Worth, uh, $21 an hour. Yes, we're actually a little higher than that because we have a four-day work week. Um, and so we have to do some calculations to translate it. But yes, we don't pay anybody underneath the housing wage because I think it would be wrong to, to pay someone a wage that they could not afford to live in the city that they're working in. Do, do you think that uh, by providing that example, we can get other major employers to follow suit? That's the reason I say it so often is because I think it shocks people. A lot of the people that are making hiring decisions or budget decisions haven't lived in an apartment in a really long time. Maybe they never did. Maybe they were you know, part of a generation that was able to buy a house very quickly. Um, and so if you have no context, right, and you're not educated, you, you sometimes are, are missing something. And so in a lot of rooms, whenever there's a microphone or if I can get the attention, I say that. And it, there's a, a report that comes out every summer. And so we always are adjusting because it's constantly moving up. But Right now it's $21.17 an hour, so tell people. And I, that's one of the things. Anybody can be an advocate for this. Um, I also say we don't say Section 8 anymore, right? Housing choice voucher is, is the way that we describe a voucher that pays for somebody's rent. Um, because there aren't Section 8 properties. Like if you, my husband, he's the worst, he drives by and says, that must be a Section 8 property. I'm like, that wouldn't pass my inspection. That's just a really bad landlord. And it's not me. And so um, just getting rid of some of those stereotypes are things that you guys can help us with because the, the wages is a serious thing. 30,000 units don't appear overnight. We're lucky if we can add 1,000 units a year. And so we're never going to catch up at this rate. Thank you, Mary Margaret. Gay Jager. Yes, sir. Um, right, so how do, we, I, how do we work with the grants? I'm the CEO of the Trinity Habitat for Humanity. We serve Johnson, Tarrant, Parker, and Wise County. Most of what we do is in Fort Worth. Um, it's a wonderful partnership with the city and, and the legions of volunteers and donors that uh, Fernando mentioned we wouldn't get it done without that because what we do doesn't make sense. And so Mary Margaret mentioned it. It's about gaps and it's about plugging gaps and how do you, where do you find the money to plug the gap, right? We find donors, we have restores where people donate things, we turn around and sell it. Hopefully you guys know about the restore. It's a great place to find stuff that you couldn't maybe otherwise afford, doesn't go to the landfill, somebody gets a tax write-off, everybody wins, it's a great resource. Uh, primarily the way we've worked with CDBG money is, so we have two uh, building products, right? We do new homes, which is where most of our effort is. We also do rehabs. 
Uh, and most of the rehab, like 99%, 98% of our rehabs are CDBG funded. We work with the city uh, closely with Cowtown Brush Up, where we go out and we paint 80 or 90 homes every year. Uh, and then we have some more intense projects that have different layers of funding that come in to, you know, go up to 25000 to do different things. Uh, so it's, it's, for us, it's added a whole new bucket. And, and what I, I like about it is, A, it's helping people. They own their home. It's about aging in place. Um, how many people want to move into a nursing home? That'd be zero people, right? Nobody's going to raise their hand for that. What do we want to do? We want to stay, I want to stay home. I'm not unique or special. I want to stay home. And if we can spend a little bit of money with those seniors to make it look better from the streetscape, because what the house looks like is important to the neighborhood and the neighbors, right? Uh, and, and make it function better for them, then that's a win. And that's, that's and we have core values at our agency. We talk about our core values, and that's the, agent, that's the core value of respect right there. We're standing on the shoulders of greatness, which are the people that came before us to do the great things to get us where we are today. Uh, and those are the people. <laughs> Those are our senior citizens that, that most of that rehab money goes into work with. So we wouldn't have that. Uh, I mean, we do 120, 130, 140 houses a year in the rehab space. It's all owner-occupied. We don't obviously touch rental to help the landlord out, but we're going to help the person that owns their home if they qualify for income and the other uh, uh, compliance needs for, for the grant then we're going to jump in and we're going to make it happen and we're going to do it with excellence and we're going to act like it's our home uh, and work with that family and, and, and get it done. So it's, it's, it's about plugging gaps. It's about, for us, it's this new, not new, we've been doing it for a while, but it's the rehab process. And, and it's, I step back and look at it strategically and from a financial standpoint, like I'm, pl I'm layering everything in. How much money is the restore going to make? How much money can we get from CDBG? How much of that CDBG, how much of that CDBG money, easy for me to say, is admin? Will the admin cover the expense of the staff overseeing that program? Uh, so the admin percentage, it doesn't need to be huge, but it's, it's darn important. Because if it's not there, then I, I crank up a program, we're doing good stuff, but now I've created a net negative. And I have to plug that hole somewhere with something to make up for the deficit, right? It's like, yay, I added units. Boo, now I'm losing an extra 100 grand a year because I'm doing you know, a million worth of dollars worth of projects, but I'm losing more money. And so uh, when, when the money can come in with enough admin support, then that makes the, the math simple and, and, and work well. But it's a, it's a wonderful program. Uh, we're blessed to have it. Um, we're, we're moving from, we, forever, we've, we've bought lots. We just framed our thousandth house the other day. Um, I, I shouldn't answer my wife's call, should I? <laughs> Probably not. I guess she doesn't know where I am. Um, we, just ra we just raised the walls on our thousandth home. And we've bought infill lots, just vacant lots here in Worth Heights, uh, all throughout Fort Worth and a lot of Tarrant County. Uh, but those, that, that price points up 700%. Forever, and I've been with Habitat 27 years, so forever we're paying five to ten thousand dollars a lot, and we cannot find enough lots at sixty thousand dollars. And that, you know, five to ten thousand a lot was 2017, 2018 number, so that's not that long ago, and that's a huge increase. So what that's done to us is, we're leaving the. Now we'll still buy infill lots if we can find them and afford them, but we're going into the raw land development business, and that's a whole new ball of whatever, twine, <laughs> that's difficult to work with. A lot of risk, a lot of complexity. Uh, and so I'm hoping and wanting to keep the rehab thing going, but find some dollars from the CDBG world to help take care of the larger land development issues that we have going. Thank you, Gage. Before you pass the mic, uh, I heard uh, a story the other day about uh, a lady in the historic South Side uh, whom you're helping to... Yeah. To build a house, who is that individual, and, well, and why are I, you doing it? If I can think of her name, what what is that young lady's name? Uh, maybe it's Opal Lee, Doctor Opal Lee. Maybe a, a person or two have heard heard of of that uh, dynamo oh, yeah. in, in our city. 
may, may we all be blessed with her energy and longevity, not to mention her obvious character. Uh, so yeah, Opal's a, a wonderful friend. She was on our founding board of directors. Uh, and, you know, God moves in mysterious ways. I, I don't understand those ways, and I never will. My brain's way too small. But she was on our board, you know, the terrible thing that happened to her on 940 East Haney where they moved in 80 plus years ago. The racist mob showed up because they didn't like the color of their skin and they chased them out of the house and they fled and then a few days later they burned, the, the mob burned the house down, right? And so Opal's a little girl uh, at that time and she said her parents never really talked about it. She, Opal didn't tell me the story until we happened to buy the lot. And so I didn't know we bought a lot because that's what we do, right? Buy a lot, build a home. Uh, and so we bought the lot to build a home. And she calls me up one day and I see Opal on my phone. I was like, hi, Opal, how you doing? She's like, Gage, you guys own my lot at 940 East Annie. I was like, we do? I was like, and I, and I didn't know it was yours. Uh, and so anyway, she then told me that terrible story, right? And I was like, well, Opal, hold on. Let me figure out in case you want to buy it. And she had called about it every now and then. And then she looked up on the Tarrant Appraisal District rolls and saw that Trinity Habitat for Humanity owned it. Uh, and so I was like, well, let me check. Let me make sure we hadn't sold it to somebody or promised it to another family. And I was like, dear Lord, please don't let it be committed someplace. Uh, and it wasn't. It wasn't. And so then we didn't sell it to her, of course. We gave it to her. Uh, and now uh, the history maker came in and just started building the home. Right, we did a, a, a groundbreaking on Opal's birthday in October. And a couple of weeks ago, uh, we did the wall raising, raised the first wall. And hopefully, if it, everything processes along, then we will move her in on June 14th. We wanted, we wanted something called Juneteenth, yeah. <laughs> just for grins. But believe it or not, Opal has commitments to places. <laughs> She's a little bit in demand. Uh, and she had a prior commitment in Dallas that she couldn't get out of. So we'll do it on June 14th if everything goes well. So anyway. She's a sweetheart. We're blessed to have her in our community, blessed to have this full circle, serendipitous thing happen where something was wrongfully taken from their family and now it gets restored. Eight decades too late. It should never have have to happen, right? Um, so it's, it's a bittersweet thing. And so it's uh, lucky to have her in our, in our life. Thank you, Gage. Daniel Smith. Good evening, everyone. My name is Daniel Smith. I work at Ohala Partners. Uh, thank you all for coming out and being present in your communities this evening. It says a lot about all of you. Um, Ohala Partners is a Texas-based real estate investment and development firm. And we focus on lots of different things, commercial real estate, you know, housing, single family and multifamily. For the last eight years, all I work on is ho creating housing in Texas. And so within the context of creating housing and CDBG and home funds, we work on everything from urban infill, conventional luxury market rate high rises to the lowest end of the spectrum where the, the need is greatest, the lower you know, price units, supportive housing for folks that were formerly homeless. Um, we work on kind of the, the next step up, which I'll call workforce housing, which is typically financed using low income housing tax credits, which, which might target folks that make 30 to $50,000 a year, and then also mixed income housing, where you have some folks paying a big rent and then some folks paying a little bit less, right? And so within the context of all of this, I think it's important to understand that the CDBG and the home funds that, that we're speaking about today, they're typically put in projects in workforce housing and supportive housing where the need is greatest, right? These are typically not going in your high-end luxury you know, developments. This is going in and you know, into the developments that are housing the working class folks of the community that make up our country. And so I think, you know, when we talk about gaps, again, just for context, when you go and develop an apartment complex or a single family home or you convert a hotel, um, there's typically a lot of capital that's required. And so when we say a gap, what we mean is, is the gap is, is, you know, we have to raise private money that might be our own. We might have to borrow some from a lender and then at the end of the day, it's not enough to get it done. And so those gaps are, um, can be filled by CDBG funds, and they're so vital because there's so many projects out there that can get to the five, four, three, two, one yard line 
but there's just not enough adequate resources to plug those gaps. And so um, for us, typically most things that we work on that have CDB funds, um, they're not the most profitable things that we work on, but they make by far the biggest impact to the communities and the neighborhoods that we live and we invest in. So, um, you know, it's a challenging resource to use sometimes of the funds, but you know, these are the types of capital that really help our communities provide ho really nice housing that folks can rent at a little bit lower rate. Um, you know, so maybe in some cases you could make 15 bucks an hour, not 20, if you can find a new development that had some CDBG funds. Thank you, Daniel. I've, I've always uh, wondered uh, why it is that someone who is so successful in the development of market rate housing takes it upon himself to tackle projects that are much more difficult, uh, much more uh, challenging, much more complex, uh, with a, a more narrow uh, profit margin, if it even has a profit margin at all, why do you do it? I don't know who you're referring to as a successful person, <laughs> but one, one thing that I've learned um, working in this space over the last five or six years is that um, it's a lot easier to make money than help people. Um, and what I mean by that is, is a lot of these developments, because they're not as profitable, there's not as many like sophisticated real estate investment, development, acquisition, redevelopment firms that want to take these things on. And so for us, I think the reason why we work on them, um, there's several reasons. One of the reasons is, is we want to be impactful in the communities that we live and invest in. Um, another reason is, is we want to be really good partners um, to our public partners that have been good to us. For example, Fort Worth Housing Solutions, the city of Fort Worth, right? Um, you know, a lot of times, you know, we go to them and ask for certain types of things, and they have always been there for us and, and helped us when things are challenging. And so I think it's, the road kind of goes both ways, right? And so um, whenever there is opportunities to use community development block grants to help different folks on the lower income um, end of the bracket, we jump at those opportunities because uh, we want to be good partners to those who have been good partners to us. Thank you, thank you Daniel. Well, all four of the speakers have uh, uh, spoken at, at least briefly about uh, the topic of affordable housing uh, and the challenges associated with it. Uh, many of those challenges, I think, uh, have to do with uh, misperceptions uh, in the uh, public mind about uh, affordable housing and, and the folks who reside uh, within uh, that housing. Uh, and as a result, uh, we often uh, see uh, opposition uh, from community groups to affordable housing projects, even projects that are uh, well-designed uh, and uh, highly uh, beneficial to the folks uh, who would live in them. Uh, nevertheless, there is this uh, uh, perception or stigma about uh, affordable housing uh, that uh, represents a, a major impediment. Uh, and I'd like to begin by asking uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Rose, but, but the others as well, uh, to give us uh, whatever insight you can uh, into this uh, uh, challenge. How do we educate, you're a professional educator, how do we educate the community about the value of affordable housing, why we need it uh, in Fort Worth, uh, uh, and, and why a neighborhood uh, should uh, uh, welcome it uh, in the right form? Thank you. I, I think you've, you've really touched on what it is. It's the language. And the point you made earlier about um, using voucher instead of Section 8, there are connotations in the language we use to tell the stories of our community. And for so long, these stories around affordable housing, people think of, of poor people and whatever they've established that to be in their head, the story that they've created around what it means to be poor in America. And that's what they've connected to housing opportunities that we would consider affordable, which is so unfortunate because 
regardless of your socioeconomic status, you deserve a place to live. You deserve access to community services. You deserve access to um, the neighborhood being a place where you can thrive as an individual or as a family. And that language is important. And I think when we talk about housing, using the right language, talking about affordable housing, reminding folks that in 2024, as we talk about wage discrepancies and the challenges around that, that to be someone eligible for some of these programs, you really are someone who could still be making what we would have considered just a few years ago a, a living wage, a reasonable wage, right? So as the cost of living goes up, as the cost of housing goes up, working class families, middle class families are now eligible for these programs. So we have to rethink and reframe the way we talk about affordable housing because we should all have access to a place that is affordable, whatever our threshold of income is. And that message has been lost. Um, I was just talking with Mayor Parker just a couple weeks ago around some of the issues we see from folks, um, the not in my backyard folks. Uh, we, we don't want folks here near me, however, again, yes, those people. We've got to stop othering folks when we talk about housing. Um, th these people should be in my backyard because they're my neighbors, they're my community. And I think that's a big part of the work we can all do, and especially when we talk about uh, the role I play, which is a, a volunteer role on this body with the CDC. But I take it so personally and, and try to be really respectful and responsible about the way that we talk about these funds and the partners that we choose because the messaging has to be clear across the board. We've got to use the same kind of language when we're talking about creating opportunities for individuals and families. And that's really what these funds and these programs allow us to do. So as much as you can contribute to reframing the language, to thinking about what it means to to have um, thriving communities at all income levels, at all access levels, folks who can age in place, generational living, multi-generational living. Those are the messages that we can send, and I think that's really important to help us reframe what it means to support these programs and to use these funds mindfully and carefully across the city and into other areas as we spread across DFW. That's great, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rose. Uh, any of the other panelists wanna respond? One thing I do when people say we don't want those people to live next to us, I often break down what they did that day. And so I say, what did your day look like? And they usually start by, I got up, got my kids ready for school, maybe dropped them off at daycare, ran through, got some coffee in the drive-thru, right? Went to work, dropped off dry cleaning. All of these things that make their life work every day and that they trust their kids with these people. And just about every single person that they touch that day qualifies for my housing. And so for me, when you're saying you don't want those people living close to you, you're not really thinking it through because don't you want the employees of the places that you frequent living close enough that they're a reliable employee that's gonna show up every morning to take care of your, your child and change their diapers? I mean, it's those type of, of people that qualify for housing. We only have about, if I could, if I could fund every voucher HUD gives me, that would be 6,500 vouchers, 6,500. I got a stat the other day, we're over 900,000 people living in Fort Worth today. And I have less than 10,000 vouchers. I can only really fund about 4,900 with the budget they give me. So that, let's just call it 5,000 people that I can help with the voucher. So if you're saying no to affordable housing, there's not another option for these people. And so if you don't like seeing homeless people on the streets, saying yes to affordable housing is really the only way that we can change this conversation and change what our city looks like. And so it's really just understanding the resources that we have and the, the solutions that we have. And affordable housing using these funding sources is one of the only ways I know, unless we can get everybody to pay $21.17 an hour at least, that we're gonna be able to make a difference. Thank you, Mary Margaret. Uh, Gage? And, uh, yeah, I'll piggyback on that just, just a bit. Um, COVID gave us new language, the essential worker. That's, that's who we're talking about. It's who uh, make our life, that's what you're alluding to, right? Who make our life possible, that do all the things uh, that we don't think about. It's just, I think it's unconscious and, and we just don't think about it. And we, and, what you were saying earlier too about we, we have some stereotypes or misconceptions about the people. Um, did some, a quick look up, for the last three years, 
70% of our family partners, and this is ranked in order of, of where they're employed from top to the top seven, medical, logistics, production and delivery, places like Cargill, Cormark, Land O'Lakes, Amazon, education, construction, banking and finance, airport or airline, and city employees. And my daughter just graduated from the University of Texas in Austin last year, STEM degree, is wanting maybe go to medical school, but she's working at St. David's Hospital uh, for a year right now to figure out what her next step will be. So she's a patient care technician. So you think doctor, you think nurse, and then you think patient care technician. They're doing all the gross stuff that nobody else wants to do. She's putting in catheters, and she's wiping rear ends in recovery all day long. She makes seventeen fifty an hour. Right? I mean, that, that, that's a big deal. And so people care about that, but then somehow they go through some weird, incorrect calculus and say, yeah, but I don't want you living next to me. You can put my catheter in or drive my kid in the bus or look after my kid, but by God, don't live next to me. Right? There's a, there's a huge disconnect there. Huge disconnect. Uh, and that's, I think we need to keep, personalize it. Think about that individual that may be somebody that says something silly, because we've all had people say silly stuff to us. Well, what do you think about Joe or Susan or Tom or, you know, that they just interacted with? I bet that person that, that just fixed your transmission, bet he doesn't make much money, but he seems like a pretty good guy. Let's invite them to live next to us. Invite them to live next to us. Thank you, Gage. I, w I want to ask, I know Danny uh, doesn't want to say too much, but I'd like for you to share with us a story about uh, NIMBYism, not in my backyard, as it relates to your Tobias Place uh, project. Tell us uh, what opposition you encountered, if you don't mind. Uh, I know you're a very positive person. How many community meetings you held? What was your strategy to get support? And how did you work it out so that by the time you organized a groundbreaking ceremony, you had the community enthusiastically coming out to support you? Uh, on a project that ordinarily a lot of folks uh, would have opposed uh, as a knee-jerk reaction to the term affordable housing. So within the specific context of Tobias Place and within the Worth Heights community, it's a similar story that we've seen play out um, over the last 10 years. And the story is largely unaffordable housing, a multifamily developer wants to come into a community and develop something. People in the community hear about it, they haven't been approached, they're cautious, they may not want it, they don't have any information. And so um, in that specific case, it was a little bit more challenging because there's four neighborhood associations all at this intersection, as well as another movement that wanted to stop all different types of development. And um, I would just say that it, it, it ties into the original question too about like the negative stigmas associated with affordable housing. I think most of the time, the active folks within the community like you here today, um, you just wanna know more and understand what exactly is being proposed. And um, in that context, I don't know the number of meetings that we had to have, but I do know this. It's that everyone is always skeptical. The answer is always no in the first meeting. And trust is not um, something that you just get in one meeting. It's something that is built over time that you have to earn. And so within Worth Heights, I would, I would just say that um, everyone within that community in the first meeting, nobody wanted a workforce housing development on Hemp Hill. There were several different kind of coalitions that didn't want to see any of that stuff. They felt like it would spur gentrification. They thought it would increase their taxes. They thought there was going to be concerns with crime and traffic and lighting and all these different things. They wanted to know who was going to be operating this, how would they operate it, what's going to happen to their schools, their kids, their sidewalks. And I think they have a right to ask all of those questions. And so anyways, within Worth Heights, it, it you know, is one of um, many affordable housing success stories that have happened around the city of Fort Worth. But I, I would just say that 
Um, largely, if I would have had a meeting like that 10 years ago, it probably wouldn't have gone as well or meetings like that. I think that rents are so high, just like a burg the cost of a cheeseburger and the cost to go buy groceries on Sunday is so high that I actually think that the walls are coming down and we're all, yeah, I don't care if you're rich, poor, white, black, brown, green, red, at the end of the day, like the housing costs are too high and for those willing to sit down with the communities and explain and provide legitimate responses and stand behind their business plan, that there is a lot of receptive communities like Worth Heights that are willing to understand that these are the types of developments that we need. Well, as, as always, uh, Mr. Smith is being uh, overly modest. Uh, I understand he held over 100 community meetings in connection with the Tobias Place project and demonstrated uh, patience beyond anything I've ever seen uh, to listen to every reasonable and unreasonable concern being expressed and responding to those concerns in constructive ways. Uh, it was a, a remarkable effort uh, and uh, we uh, uh, appreciate uh, uh, everything you've done to, to bring that uh, challenging project to fruition. Uh, there are uh, groups that are uh, known as uh, NIMBY, not in my backyard. I think uh, Mr. Smith faced uh, some folks who uh, might be classified as uh, uh, banana people. Uh, banana is an acronym that stands for build absolutely nothing anywhere near anything. Uh, and, uh, and those folks are prevalent uh, in Fort Worth uh, uh, and other cities as well. Uh, so thank you. Thank you for your valiant uh, efforts. Uh, and so uh, let me uh, pose one more question and then if we have time, uh, I'd like to open the floor for, for questions uh, uh, from, from the audience. Uh, uh, besides funding from CDBG or home or other sources, uh, what are the challenges that, uh, that each of you are encountering uh, in uh, the development of affordable housing and uh, uh, livable uh, neighborhoods? And uh, how uh, do you recommend that the city and uh, the community more broadly address those challenges? Are you okay with me starting first? Yes, sir. I have the mic yes, sir. right here. Please. I, I would say the largest challenge is definitely land use or zoning. And I think that the way that that challenge is overcome is through meetings like this, and then just being present within the communities and being willing to be patient and answer people's questions and be pro being proactive. And so gone are the days of hi hiring the zoning consultant in the black suit and hoping that he can get it done and in with the days with sitting in front of folks of the people that live in these actually communities where you want to invest and build and, and be in. Yeah, the, uh, other than funding, um, I, I alluded to it earlier, affordability. Our, you know, our real estate price is up 700%. Our construction cost is up 100% in the last few years. So affordability is the uh, top most on my mind. Um, raw land development, where we're moving because those infill lots are so expensive, is exceedingly difficult. Uh, we work well with the city, but the process within any municipality is onerous at best, getting it zoned and then just through the entitlement phase of platting and, and engineering uh, just it takes incredible amounts of time and that's expensive and, and difficult to deal with. Uh, what to do? Uh, I think the only way we're going to come close, Mary Margaret mentioned how many units we need, right? Uh, affordable units in general. Uh, Mary Margaret's not going to solve the problem. Gage is not going to solve the problem. You're not going to, right? I mean, no one of us are going to do that. Even the three of us, all of us up here, aren't going to solve the problem. So it takes something larger, is my point, to, to solve the problem. Uh, and what we really need to do, and I've been thinking about this a lot, is create incentives to incent the for-profit men and women to include an affordable component. 
we can't tax and spend our way there because other states would have done it by now if they could have figured out how to do that. And, and I'm saying, saying that's not bad. That's part of it, right? We're getting CDBG, CDBG money and we need it. And it's a good piece of the puzzle. But creative in, creating incentives that work for the developer's spreadsheet, that short cycle the time, that waive some fees. It has to work for the city too, right? I mean, the city has a budget and every single person in here needs the city budget to work. So it's not like because they're a government entity, they have endless pockets. They have constraints and everything too. Uh, so within the context of that, it's working to create those incentives that when, and I don't know, Fernando, how many homes we plat, we city of Fort Worth, 10,000, 5,000 a year, New lot, something like that. I mean, holy cow. What if 10% of them? 10,000 single family homes. Yeah. What if 5% of those were affordable? That'd be 500 units. Guess what? I wouldn't be in the land development business anymore. I'd have for profit developers knocking on my door saying, hey, Gage, we uh, need to build 82 homes in here to heat out. Can you do that? I was like, you betcha. That, that's, that would be the home run. It, would just, it needs to. It can't be they have so much money they can just afford to do it, or the city has just so much money they can afford to do it, because neither of those statements are true. It has to work for their spreadsheet, that little propeller head sitting in Excel, jamming the spreadsheet, ah, this makes sense. And then it, then it will work. Then we can get beyond just a few players trying to, trying to make it happen and, and, and incent the, the market, the larger market, to deliver units that we all need. That's, a, that's an excellent point, uh, Gage, and uh, I can think of no city better than Fort Worth uh, situated uh, to do uh, just as you have suggested. Uh, we are the fastest growing big city in the country. Uh, we're growing uh, uh, rapidly, not just in uh, population, but in households, employment. Uh, we have many opportunities to draw upon private investment to achieve uh, public purposes. Uh, and so providing incentives uh, for uh, private developers to uh, incorporate affordable housing into their projects uh, uh, makes good uh, economic sense. Uh, and uh, we have many opportunities, not only on the periphery of Fort Worth, but even in the central city uh, with projects like uh, Panther Island uh, on the near north side of, of Fort Worth. Uh, we've begun discussions about uh, the desirability of promoting uh, what we call equitable development uh, on Panther Island, development that meets uh, the needs of the, of the community and of all segments uh, of the community. How can we make that happen? I think incentivizing the private sector uh, is an important uh, strategy by which to achieve that goal. So thank you, Gage, for uh, suggesting it. Uh, Mary Margaret? I mean, I echo what both of um, the gentlemen have, have mentioned. Zoning and, and some incentives are definitely needed. One of the things that really is challenging when you're working with this type of funding is the regulations that come along with it. And so with regulations, um, it makes it more difficult. And so it's really hard for us to find pools of vendors that are willing to work under those conditions in some cases. There's a lot of compliance that's required, a lot of reporting that's required. Um, and so sometimes our... Our pools of um, contractors shrink, and then the subs shrink because of that, and the prices go up. And so um, that becomes a challenge, and really having a prepared workforce that's ready for the work when it comes is a big deal. And so making sure that we have trades that are involved and know when work is coming, um, because a lot of times we're fighting um, Houston or other large cities where there's a lot of construction going on to keep people on the job and keep them moving, because it's all about timing, right? timing of the funding flowing, timing of construction, because everything that we do comes with completion dates that we promise either the federal government, the municipality, or the state government that we're gonna hit. And so if you have a, a GC that gave you a great budget and a great um, schedule, and then you know as soon as we close and, and we break ground with that pretty shiny shovel, you know, you get a change order that says 90 day extension, like they, they already have a big issue, it really can throw these projects off. And so, I'm actually headed to DC next week to talk about streamlining building of affordable housing. Like what can we get rid of that would make building affordable housing quicker and easier um, and be able to compete with market rate housing? Because if you have two projects that are sitting there 
a market rate project is much easier to go out and build and be be a part of. And so we need to make it attractive to be building affordable housing. Thank you very much. Uh, oh, sorry, I should. Ms. Rose. Uh, yeah, I, w I will say as I'm listening to you, um, what everyone else has already share shared, uh, the message for me really is how are we being proactive in this space? Uh, as a city that is growing so quickly uh, and a world where things are changing so fast, a lot of our policies have been reactive. We've had to react to the situations post-COVID in particular on processes and operational costs. Um, we have been in a reactive state for a very long time. Proactive planning, which I know that members of our city council are working on, and certainly Mayor Parker, to be proactive in this space requires us to do a lot more community education, a lot more um, important and, and mindful messaging, a lot more awareness building, uh, training and development for the workforce that we need to help us with these projects. And that takes a lot of investment in people power as well as in the, the financing of that. And so finding ways that we can think about how we create our, our own workforce to educate them well, that we're doing that for our community members so that they understand when these projects come up, we don't need to have 100 meetings, which takes a year and a half. We can say get a yes from a community immediately because they already know what it means when we talk about these programs and these projects. So when we can do that, and again, that's why I'm so thankful that so many of you are here as, as advocates and ambassadors in your community, being able to share that out is really what we need. That education will allow us to be a lot more proactive in providing the type of resources and spaces that our community really needs. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Rose. Well, we have uh, uh, just a few minutes left. Uh, uh, but enough time to, to field a couple of questions uh, from the audience. Yes, sir, please. Uh, I and if uh, you could uh, speak into the mic. Uh. Oh, I think they, All right. they should be able to hear me. Can we hear you? We're good. We Thank you. I, I was just thinking, you know, I, I, uh, you, you were saying about $2,100 uh, $21 an hour. Mm -hmm. the, the people then, like in my church, we have people who are making like, Ten or fifteen dollars an hour. The Sunshine Church, we 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 purchased, we built two houses last year, and then four years ago we built two houses on Andrew at a cost of about 130. We are renting those houses through the housing authority for 800 dollars because they didn't qualify for a three bedroom house. Uh, the taxes is six thousand five hundred. Insurance. Uh, 1500 So we're spending about uh, $8,000, and we're making 9000 you know. And, and so hopefully the taxes will go up much more because it's going to push us out of, 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 uh, of helping them. Uh, I was wondering, how much uh, are you paying for a vacant lot? Well, for a vacant lot, they're... I can find one for fifty. Thank you. If I can find one for fifty thousand, we're lucky, and I really can't. I don't know if I've bought one for that much or that little in the last couple of years. But they're sixty to seventy thousand for vacant lots, which is why we're now looking at at raw land development instead. Or when I have bought a few vacant lots, like I bought nine vacant lots in Como, they're all contiguous. I think we paid sixty thousand dollars a lot, which is more than I wanted. But we're building, but we're building twenty townhomes on it, because it no longer made sense to do single family; just get nine units, so that we're putting twenty on on top of it instead. How how is that project going, Gage? Uh, the the twenty unit project in Como. Well, that's a good collaboration with the city. Um, so the street carver that it's on is uh, it runs into a dead end. They're needing to vacate Merrick because it's just a goat trail right there. There's no real street left. Uh, and there's no water and sewer in the street. Uh, and I don't have the most up to date, but I think maybe that water and sewer insulation that the city's gonna do with us in, behalf, in partnership, but I think it may have gotten pushed to the next cycle. But uh, I'm not sure if that's a, still 100% correct. I don't keep my finger on that pulse uh, all the time. So anyway, it may have gotten delayed a little bit from the water sewer. Okay, another example of the challenges associated uh, with infill development. Yeah, and, and partnerships. I mean, what did, uh, 
Winston Churchill say? The only thing worse than fighting a war by yourself is fighting, <laughs> or no, the only thing worse than fighting a war with partners is fighting a war by yourself, True. right? I mean, so it takes partners to collaborate and get things done. Mm -hmm. All right, other questions? Just one other thing. Yes, sir. Uh, you mentioned about helping people to rent houses. How about, buy, do y'all have a program to help them to buy a house? Yes. It's like I planted you there, and I didn't. I didn't even meet you before this. Um, so the Housing Authority operates a home ownership program, and so many people don't know that you can use a housing choice voucher to pay for a mortgage and insurance for 20 years. And so our goal is that people don't stay on housing forever, right? About half of who we serve on a voucher program are elderly or disabled, and I would say 90 5% of those that are able to work are working. Um, we don't have that many people that are, that are not working on our program that aren't elderly or disabled. But the homeownership program is something that HUD has established to allow people to use their voucher to actually buy a home and then earn that equity. And so we just had one of my favorite stories um, of the year so far. We've closed on about 16 houses using vouchers so far this year. We have 250 people in the pipeline. But one of our residents um, was a former Cabell Place resident, so she lived in public housing with her two sons. And when we um, were going to demolish Cabell, she received a housing choice voucher and relocated to an apartment. And then she worked with us on her um, credit building, her financial literacy, budgeting, started saving. And um, she just bought her first home in Stop 6. Um, and it happens to be a lot that we sold to an affordable housing um, single family developer. And so she moved in about a month ago. We got to cut the ribbon and she is happy as a clam. I mean, that's the way it should work. And so she'll now get to enjoy all that equity. And um, usually what happens is when you're buying a home, you're, you're making a pretty good income at that point. And so she'll go off the program when she's over income and then that voucher will in turn go to the next person in line on the waiting list. Because we typically have, um, we open our, our um, wait list about every four years or so, and we get about 20,000 applicants, and um, we do a lottery for 5,000 spots. So it takes, it's like getting a golden ticket or winning the lottery um, to be able to get a housing choice voucher. So we're excited that she's moving in the right direction to give it back to the next person. Thank you. Great questions. Uh, other questions from the audience? Yes, ma'am, in the back. I wanted to know when you're talking about the development part, you were saying that not like anything, knowledge is not knowing and not in my backyard. But have you gone to other communities in the sense to show them what you I'm sure you have to show them what you've gone, but sometimes people need to see it. You can tell people all you want, but sometimes I need to touch it or I need to see it or I'm not saying to go tour people's houses. I'm just saying it's something that mm -hmm. make them aware. You're absolutely right. So we had one of those public meetings in like a gymnasium with a bunch of people in a microphone and it turned into kind of like a mob, right? Everybody was against it. No, no, no. And as a follow up to that, I thought these people need to just be able to ask questions, right? And understand. So we actually held a community coffee in the clubhouse of one of our properties and invited the homeowners from that area and just said, come meet us for some coffee and chicken minis. And we're going to tell you who needs affordable housing, where it is, why, what it is, you know, and we just started with the very basics and then had one-on-one -on -one conversations and they saw, hey, this is an apartment that I would live in. This isn't those apartments and it, they're not any place that are scary or, you know, there's not crime. And so we did that all around the city um, and we, we give tours. I feel like I'm a tour guide um, a lot because part of it is just opening it up and letting people see it, and then their minds change really quickly. So you're exactly right. That's one of our, our strategies. Well, people do tend uh, to carry around uh, misperceptions about uh, affordable housing, and yet when you take the time uh, to uh, educate them and to show them actual examples of what you're proposing to do, they tend to change their minds. Uh, and so education about affordable housing is uh, a big part of our responsibility uh, in city government and, and among others who are involved in affordable housing development. Uh, uh, by educating the public, uh, we can gather support uh, for the projects that we're trying to implement. So thank you for that question. Yes, ma'am. So the, the message is out there that uh, 
affordable housing is just a free ticket and it's an encouragement not to work and all these negative things. So how do you explain to people how a voucher works and the necessity for people to pay 30% of their income you know, or at least a minimum amount so that they understand? I like to tell people, like, do you, as a homeowner, do you spend 30% of your income just on your mortgage? And most people don't because they're in that situation, right? They've, been, they've had that blessing. So how do you explain to people that it's it's more of a burden for those who, who are earning less? Especially those that are on a fixed income. If you think about our seniors and those that are on disability and the check that they get every month, which is typically less than $1,000, where can they go find housing for $300 a month? Is that some place you want your grandmother or you want your family member that probably has higher needs, you know? And so um, when you really break it down and put it in those terms, people do understand the numbers. But everybody on a housing choice voucher or in affordable housing typically pays 30% of their adjusted income. And so that looks different for different people. Um, Daniel builds a really nice product, and if you can find a 30% unit set aside for those that are making 30% of the AMI, you can live in a Class A property, um, or somebody that needs an opportunity can live in that Class A property. And they should, because in order to do better, they have to see better, right? In order to dream, they have to know it's possible. And if you grew up um, in a community like Butler Place, right, that was completely shut off from the rest of the world by highways, Right, and you went up the hill to I.M. Terrell to elementary school, and then you walked back home, and it took you an hour on a bus to get to the closest grocery store. I mean, those are the real stories that these families faced growing up in these communities. And so the, the people that are on our program, they don't want to be in the position they're in. They came in in crisis. They had no other place to turn. Most people are really proud. No one ever walks around and says, I'm on housing, right? That's not something somebody starts a conversation with. Um, but, but education, I mean, today I think everybody's here to get an education, and, and I've, I've gotten so much from the audience. You guys have been great. But just educating our, our neighbors is important. So thank you, Leah. The 30% the doing the math, right? The math maths, and, and it says something. Um, Thank you for that question and that uh, important point about uh, how these efforts are intended to uh, support and empower our residents, not to, to give them a, a free ticket. Any other questions? Uh, yes, ma'am. I have a question, and I'm just going to throw it out there. I worked in emergency room assistance. I'm not there anymore because it's closed down. But um, I still have clients that call me seniors and, and they are my heart, seniors are my heart. But when I have a senior that's calling me because his check is around eight hundred dollars a month, he's been basically priced out of the any any decent besides a dump somewhere where it's horrible. And I keep up with him because I help him fill out forms. I've I've had him on a waiting list now for two years. Today I got a call because I'm his contact now because I'm trying to get him a senior apartment. He's up three, three people are ahead of him and he is like struggling, okay? And um, I talked talk to the case manager said, well, does he have any, no, nothing on his background. Does he have an addiction? Yes, because he couldn't afford an uh, $850 rent. He got sick, he had a stroke, and basically he got evicted. And the judge said, you have till November 21st to pay $1,075 to get the eviction. Well, the eviction doesn't come off. It just goes to a zero balance, because we're in Texas. This is something I learned working with Iraq. How can, or what can, you have 30% income? When you see a senior that comes in with that kind of thing, he's going to get turned down. He is, he, I've had him. There's nothing I can do. And it hurts me because he is a good man. And I have other seniors like that, and it just kills me that I was on the phone today trying to find out, calling the county, please, and praying, please, Lord, 
don't let that addiction be on him because he's three, three names away from getting into a decent, semi-decent senior living and they're probably going to turn him down. And he's going to be on Lancaster. I'd be happy to get your information and learn where he's applying so I can understand, you know, who manages it. A lot of it has to do with the type of funding. If it's a tax credit property, unfortunately, a lot of the management companies have very strict rental criteria. And if we don't follow that, then it turns into a fair housing problem. But we do have other properties that have more um, flexible standards. And so Daniel and I are shaking our heads because we have other programs and properties that we're able to um, house people that don't have to follow those, you know, guidelines. And so I'd be happy to, to help you navigate that system and find some place because the last thing we want to do is add to our homelessness population, especially with our seniors. Yeah, I would mimic what Mary Margaret said, but also add Again, we, we will try to help and we probably can, but the truth is, is that you're right. It's a problem. It's very real. There's so much demand for these lower income, 30%, 40, 50% AMI units. And so what happens is, is if you're a property management company and you have 100 people applying for one unit, Again, it's a business, right? And there's people going through different, you know, criminal background, credit. I mean, you know, there's a, a, a lady, a man, someone has a job to go through this, and you have two applications on your desk, and you have one, I mean, you're not going to like the response, it's the truth. You have one tenant who had an eviction and one tenant who didn't. To, it's a decision. Right, it's a risk based decision. And so it's more of like, a, I don't know. A societal problem it's the same thing with credit right with people who go to jail and had one credit card and they were in you know they couldn't pay their credit card for four years and so their credit got completely destroyed and then they came out and then they can't rent an apartment anywhere because they have no credit it's a it's a similar scenario and so anyways I'm sure that we can help out in some capacity but this is just like one very small example of a of a much larger problem whereas like Mary Margaret and I can't you know help find seniors all over the whole, you know, United States of America. So I think we can help, but largely I think it's more of like a federal or state legislative issue that, that needs to be addressed. I just want something to change because he is not a criminal. He is a senior, $700 a month, and he got an eviction. He is not a criminal. But even criminals have to afford it. And oh something needs to change because if I see a, if I saw a senior coming across, if I had the power of anything, if I saw a senior coming across and I said, I have a 30-year-old couple with kids, and yes, they're they're into that 30 percent, but I have a senior that has an addiction is about to be homeless. I'm sorry, I want the senior because you're 30. Figure it out. I'll help you figure it out. I'll help you with credit. I'll help you. You know, I'll be the mom to you because I have mom on many of my clients. You know, but I, just, I, I need something that y'all have the authority to say, look, when there's just an eviction and it's a senior and you understand the reason there is this eviction, please don't let that be the stopping point. They're not criminals. I, I think we can probably help, especially now that we have a really good co-signer here, so. <laughs> I, I, th I think the larger, the larger question, you said societal, and I think that's essentially right. I read a fascinating article in The Atlantic that talked about homelessness, and it said the obvious answer to homelessness is the price of a home. And so what happens is, as housing goes up, whether it's rental or home ownership, uh, it puts pressure and put people end up using units that that person could have been in that when the price is so expensive, they make more money, but they're still down in this level and they're, they're consuming the space, right? And so, I mean, it's a good example of California house, price of a house, cost of a house versus West Virginia, which is nothing close to California. And the poverty rates aren't the same, but California has half the homeless rate in the country and West Virginia has a higher poverty rate, but not very many homeless because their homes don't cost as much. Well, thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, uh, thank 
uh, all of you uh, in the audience for your attention and your participation uh, in our uh, uh, discussion this evening. Uh, special thanks to our four uh, uh, panelists. Uh, uh, again, uh, Ms. Uh, Ebony Rose, uh, uh, Mary Margaret uh, Lemons, Gage Yeager, and Daniel Smith. Uh, uh, this has been a, a wonderful uh, uh, educational experience uh, for me, as I hope it's been uh, for everyone uh, uh, in the audience tonight. Uh, we have a big challenge in Fort Worth, uh, and I'm uh, more motivated than ever before uh, to do my part toward tackling it. So thank you all very much for your participation. Have a good evening.